Well, we've been going through the book of Romans, not for seven years, <laughs> but yeah, I believe it's, we're in Romans 10, I believe it's been over a year, but that's also because we've, uh, we've jumped out of Romans a few times. Well, we are in Romans chapter 10. We're going to be looking at verses 14 through 21 this morning. Um, would you pray with me? God, uh, we just welcome you this morning to have your way and to speak to us through your word. Lord, give us ears to hear, Lord, and hearts to receive and a desire to do what you've called us to do. God, you are a good God, Lord, and, and your ways are good and pure and wise, and they're the way to life, Lord. And so that's why we trust you, Jesus, and we trust your word. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Paul says at the very beginning of Romans, in Romans 1, 16, it's actually what I consider the thesis of this book. He says that the gospel, that is the good news, is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. I mean, that's, that's the reason that we're here, right? Is because we believe the good news. We believe the gospel about Jesus Christ, that we've been set free. And, and we're also here, we're going to find out, so that we can go and bring that good news to other people. And, and Paul is sharing, is, is, is sharing with a, a church of, of both Jew and Gentile, uh, a, a big theme in this, in this letter that he's writing to them is, look, guys, uh, I know you're, you're, you're not used to being together, right? Uh, but now in Christ, you are one, both Jew and Gentile, and the gospel is for you, right? For both of you, right? It's for the whole world. And so that's the theme. And, and he says that this message, when we declare this message of Jesus Christ, it has the power to transform lives. But if it's so powerful, then why do we find, like, for instance, like one sibling in a household might believe while the other sibling doesn't? Why does it seem to, why does the gospel seem to penetrate some areas and then other areas, it doesn't. I mean, Jesus even talks about a seed that's scattered. It's the gospel being scattered. And like some people receive it and other people, they don't. Why do some whole people groups, like there's some parts of the world, there's whole nations, right? Um, where it seems like the majority don't believe while other people group, groups do. And in Paul's day, it wasn't just any people. It was God's special nation, right? It was the nation he called from Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. It was the people of Israel. They were supposed to be God's people, yet they had rejected their own Messiah. The very Christ that was sent to them, the majority, right? I would say many in the people, not all of them, the, the, the 12 disciples to start with, they were Jews, right? And they believed. And there were others that believed, but there was a lot of them. You would expect it. This was God's people, and their Messiah came, the whole group, you know, as a whole. Most of them would come and turn to Jesus, but they didn't. And so we asked the question this morning, if the gospel is so powerful, why don't some people turn to Jesus? All right, let's look at Romans chapter 10, if you have your Bibles or your iPads or your droids or however you read uh, God's word in 2023, uh, turn to Romans chapter 10. We'll start in verse 14. And we're asking the question, what hinders people from embracing Jesus? Paul says this, he says, well, he asks this rather, he says, how then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him in whom they have not heard? And how are they to hear without somebody preaching? And how are they to preach unless they are sent? He says, as it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. And so what we find is that sometimes it's a sending problem. Here's the thing. If we don't go, how will they know? Like, 
let that settle for a minute. Meditate on that. Like, if we, we don't go, how will they know? Because a lot of times we're waiting for somebody else to do it, you know? But if we don't go, as the church, we are commissioned. We are the church. We are the body who's to bring the light of, the, of Christ to the world, to bring the gospel, the good news to the world. And so if we don't go, how in the world are they going to know? And if we're just preaching to other Christians, like Paul, like this gospel, y'all have heard me say this as we've gone through this letter, uh, that, that Paul uh, says that the gospel isn't just for unbelievers, it's for believers. And so y'all have heard me say that we continually need the good news. That's part of making disciples, right? Because there's that surface level of receiving Christ, but then when, as we grow in the richness of Christ and who he is, that's the gospel. And we too need the gospel. And he is preaching to a bunch of Christians there in Rome. He is giving them the gospel and he was anxious to go to them and share the gospel with them. But if we're just preaching to Christians, right? If we're our own echo chamber, how is the world going to know? We're gonna be a closed system. In a lot of ways, the church is becoming more of a closed system, right? Because people aren't coming to us. I mean, statistics show people aren't coming into the church. We've got to go out there. We've got to bring the church to them. We've got to bring Jesus to them, to the world, because they're not coming here. So if we're just preaching to other Christians, how will they know? If we, if we make it all about just our own backyard, and I understand, like, in our, in our nation and in a lot of ways, just like with family, you got to take care of your own, right? you you got a responsibility. We have a responsibility to our family. We have a responsibility to our nation. I understand that. I really do. But understand this, that God loves the whole world. He loves all nations. He doesn't just, and that's the whole point that Paul's just trying to make. God isn't just about Israel. He's not just about the Jews. He's about the whole world. And so we as believers, we can't be just about America. We can't be just about our own backyard, right? And so I understand the responsibility we have to our nation. But especially as it pertains to the gospel, which has outworkings that are just beyond sharing Jesus, but the way we love others, we have a responsibility to the whole world. So if we don't go and we don't send people into the world, how will they know? If we can't get comfortable with being uncomfortable, how will they know? Because here's the thing is like you can have all the tact in the world and I recommend having tact. You know, Paul says if you're just a, a clanging symbol. If, if, if you don't speak in love, if we don't preach the gospel in love, we don't want to be the bullhorn preacher who's just spewing hate to everybody. We want to share Jesus and we want it to be good news. We want people to understand that it is good news. But here's the thing. You can have all the tact. And all the love in the world, you can build relationships, you can do all that. And when Jesus comes out of your mouth and you start to share the good news, the devil doesn't like it. The darkness doesn't like it. And so you're going to face, you're going to have some major victories, right? You're going to see the Holy Spirit come through and you're going to see people transformed, but you're also going to see resistance. You're going to. Jesus says, no matter how you do it, if you open your mouth and you talk about me, you're going to get resistance. So we can learn all these techniques and ways to, sh and I, believe me, we want to learn how to speak in love. Because we want people, if they're resisting Jesus, we want it to be because of Jesus, not because of us. But if you open your mouth and you speak of Jesus, you will. And so we need to be, get comfortable with being uncomfortable. Me too. It's easy. I mean, it's not easy to stand behind a pulpit and preach the gospel, but it's easier sometimes than out there, Right? Because again, we got unbelievers that come in, but most of you are believers. Most of you are amen. We got to get comfortable with being uncomfortable. Even the first disciples had to pray for boldness. Lord, give us boldness because we're being persecuted. Help us. We need your Holy Spirit. And if we make it too much about, uh, hear me out again, if we make it too much about relationship, right, and not telling, right, because there are those, again, going back to the bullhorn preacher, there's, there's those who, who share the gospel and um, 
It's like a car salesman, right? <laughs> and people are put off by that, right? And so we talk about building relationships because when you build a relationship with somebody, then they're more like walls start to come down, right? And they start to, to listen. But if we make it, if we go too far, right? Some people say, oh, it's all about relationship, but you make it all about relationship and you never open your mouth about Jesus, how are they gonna know? You can love them to death, right? <laughs> and they'll never know. So if we don't go, how will they know? And so we at the Haven, we can't just be a church that values community. And I say that because we do that so well. <laughs> We're really good at community. We're really good at being a family. We're really good at even welcoming outsiders, right? We don't have any problems with the outsiders. But we also got to be about the Great Commission. We got to be about telling this world about Jesus. So sometimes it's a sending problem. Sometimes it's a preaching problem. Paul quotes Isaiah 52, 7. He says, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. In other words, Isaiah is telling uh, Judah, he's saying uh, the nation of, of Israel, in particular Judah, he's saying you're about to be in exile, right? God's going to send judgment. Uh, Babylon is going to come and carry you off into exile. But I just want to encourage you that salvation is going to come. And it's going to be beautiful when the messengers come with the good news that God reigns and he is for you. That's, what the, that's the context of what he is, is quoting there from Isaiah 52, 7. And this good news was initially declared through the Messiah himself, Jesus Christ, when he was born in a manger there in Bethlehem. The angels declared that the good news has come through the Messiah Jesus. And so not only Jesus, but his disciples, his apostles came, they declared the good news, and we are to follow after that. But here's the thing. If a math teacher is teaching history to math students, then there's a disservice, right? They're not learning math. Preaching has to be gospel-centered. It has to be Christ-centered. Uh, 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 now, now, here's the thing. There is a place for self-help. Some will say, no, there's no place for self-help in the church. I, I disagree. There is a place for self-help because we're learning to be new creations, right? We're learning to walk in the Holy Spirit and be who God's called us to be. And that is a form of self-help, right? Because we're learning to be who God has created us and redeemed us to be through Jesus Christ. But all of that has to be Christ-centered. It has to be centered around the cross, the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, and that he is Lord and he is King, right? We don't get self-help on our own. We need Jesus, they need Jesus. The world needs Jesus. It has to be Christ-centered. The gospel has to take precedence. So sometimes it's the subject matter that's being preached. Other times it's just a false Jesus that's being preached. Right? That's why we have cults and Christian cults and false messiahs. I mean, Jesus warned about false messiahs that were to come, right? Right? Not only false messiahs, but even the mainstream cults, you know, the Mormons and the Jehovah's Witnesses. So sometimes it's a Jesus, but it's, it's a false Jesus. It's a different Jesus that's presented in the Bible. So it's a preaching problem. And on one hand, I've mentioned the bullhorn preacher a couple times, the hellfire and brimstone. We focus too much on that that can, luck, that can lack love, grace, and the good news of the gospel. I've read gospel tracts in the past where it's like 85% bad news, and then it tacks on at the end. But if you receive Jesus, yay, you get to go to heaven and read your Bible now. Like, dude, wow, you spent like 90% of it on bad news, and then you just say, hey, awesome, you get to go to heaven. So here's the thing, like too much hell, hellfire and brimstone is not, is not good, but here's the other thing on the other end of the spectrum, y'all like, know how I like to swing from one end of the spectrum to the other, not preaching judgment lacks honesty for one, 
We're not being honest with our hearers. We're not, we're not telling them the truth. It lacks love, just like going the other way lacks love. It lacks love because you're not being truthful. And it lacks, it, it lacks the opportunity for awakening. Here's the thing. I did not, and I've said this before, I did not come to Jesus because I was afraid of going to hell. I didn't love, I don't love Jesus because I'm afraid of going to hell. That's a wrong motivation to love anybody, right? Out of fear. But here's the thing. Judgment sure got my attention. It awakened me. When I was in a slumber, it got my attention, made me start thinking about greater things. And so too much hellfire and brimstone can lack love, grace, and the gospel, but not preaching judgment is just as harmful. Jeremiah 14, 13 through 14, the prophet said, Ah, Lord God, behold, the prophets are saying to, to the people, You shall not see the sword, nor shall you see famine, but I will give you assured peace in this place. And then Jeremiah says, And the Lord said to me, He says, The prophets are prophesying lies in my name. I did not send them, nor did I command them to speak to them. They are prophesying to you a lying vision, worthless divination, and the deceit of their own minds. Now, this was Old Testament, right? This is a little bit of a different context, but the same still applies. Paul says in 2 Timothy 4, 3 through 4, For a time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but have itching ears. They will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions and will turn away from listening to the truth, and they're going to wander off into myths. We need to be very careful with our preaching. So our preaching, preaching of the gospel, gospel is all good news. That's just literally what the word means. It's, it's, just, it's just all good news. That's what the gospel is. So the bad news isn't the gospel. But the good news necessitates that there's bad news, right? <laughs> to overcome, right? And so preaching starts with Bad news, and it ends with good news. Romans 6.23, the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Romans 3.23.25, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Jesus Christ, whom God put forth as a propitiation, a sacrifice, an atonement by his blood to be received by faith, right? The good news is introduced. There's a free gift of God that is given to you. Just trust him and look to Jesus as Lord and you will be saved. You will be a child of God, but you need to be set free from sin, which leads to death and judgment. Sometimes the problem is, is the preaching, the way we speak to others. And here's the thing. Some people have honest questions. Some people have honest hurt. Not everybody who has tough questions, not everybody whose questionings are, are these evil, rebellious people. We can't put them all in the same category. It's not our job to, really. I love how Paul spent time reasoning with his hearers. He would reason, and sometimes they would ask, hey, Paul, would you come back tomorrow and, and, and share with us more, right? Right? And I can imagine it wasn't all just monologue like I'm doing here, right? There was some, there was some dialogue going back and, and, and forth, and he reasoned. Like in order to reason, you got to have, you know, people are asking questions. They're asking those tough questions. What about this? What about this? I think we as Christians should be willing to invest the same in, in other people and be patient with other people. When Paul would dust, you know, when he would move on, you know, and, and when he, like, okay, that's enough, I'm, I'm taking on, it wasn't because people had tough questions. It's because they were persecuting him. So there is a time to move on, right? Don't throw your pearls before swine, lest they come and they turn and attack you. But everybody who has tough questions and everybody who has hurt and everybody who has anger issues, don't paint them all as swine. We need to be patient with people and love people, Right? We're the ones that are sent with healing that should come out of us and flow into other people. Sometimes it's a preaching problem. 
Paul says sometimes it's a hearing problem. What about those who've never heard the gospel? This may make some of you feel uncomfortable. I, I, I can't answer that question. I'm not their judge. What I do know is Jesus says, I'm the way, the truth, the life, and no one comes to the Father but by me. Uh, Romans, actually earlier in Romans, at the beginning of Romans, Romans 1.20, Paul says that God's invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and his divine nature, they have been clearly perceived, clearly seen ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made so that people are without excuse. So he's saying that like nature preaches of God. Nature tells of God. We look at nature and we say, hey, there is a creator. And he says, so the word without excuse, saying that when people look at nature, we say in our hearts and in our consciences, there, there is a, a God. There's something else that is causing us to resist that creator, that, that God. So the question becomes, they're without excuse. Nature preaches, can people serve the one true God without hearing uh, 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 about Jesus? I don't, I'm not talking about the worshiping false gods or, or, or whatever. I'm talking about, you know, that hypothetical that people put out of the person on the island who has never heard if they're trying to follow God. I can't answer that question. I'm not, their, I'm not their judge. You know, Jesus says, no one comes to me, but, you know, no one comes to the Father, but by me. Does it work that, you know, can people somehow come to God, you know, to Jesus through, through worshiping the one true God? Again, I'm not their judge, and I'm glad I'm not, <laughs> and I'm glad that I don't have to be, right? When I preach the funeral of lost people, that's one thing, you know, I'm, I can, you, you can feel sometimes you, that you're know, pretty sure that somebody's lost, but in, in the end, that's how I come from people, you, you know, families that's grieving, Right? A lost one that the, they don't think knew Jesus. You don't have to be their judge. You can let that go. You don't have to be their judge. But here's the thing, though. People that are alive and, and are here, we as the church, we need to live our lives as if everyone needs to hear the good news of Jesus Christ. Everyone. Paul says, how are they to believe in him of whom they have never heard? And so that's why there's whole missions organizations that are focused on unreached people groups. Now, there's some that believe, you know, they've got to reach a little here. You know, they believe they see that in the gospel that, that each people group. But I believe God loves all, all people, right? <laughs> and so we need to have a heart for all people. And there are people that have never heard of Jesus, and we want the good news to go out to them. We need to send people out to those places. Maybe you're somebody who God is calling to go out into those places. So sometimes it's a sending problem. Sometimes it's a preaching problem. Sometimes it's a hearing problem. Those are all reasons that people do not turn to Jesus. They do not embrace Jesus Christ. But man, sometimes it's just a believing problem. Many times it's just a believing problem. Sometimes Christians are going and they're, and they're preaching and, and people are hearing and they're just not believing. Israel had a faith problem. They had a believing problem and it started with a heart problem. The reasons for unbelief in the world vary, but many times it boils down to a matter of the heart. Let's take a look at the role of the heart in embracing Jesus. Verse 16, Paul says, But they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah says, now when he says they, he's talking about Israel. He's talking about, you know, he's not talking about everybody. The context here is he's addressing Israel and their unbelief. What's going on here, right? If they're God's people, what, what in the world is going on here? He says, But they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed what he has heard from us? Verse 17, so Paul says, so faith comes from hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. But I ask, have they, Israel, have they not heard? Paul says, indeed they have heard, for their voice has gone out into the, uh, all of the earth and their words to the end, ends of the world. And so sometimes it's not a matter of sending, preaching, or hearing. It's a matter of the heart. And Paul says that 
That was the, that's the issue at hand. That's the, the issue with, with Israel. That's the issue with, with the Jews. And so he quotes Isaiah 53, 1, uh, which is about Jesus, right? That, that, that whole chapter is the most amazing prophecy in all of the Old Testament. There's a lot of good ones. So that's saying a lot about Isaiah 53, um, where Isaiah says uh, to Israel that the message, in, in, in essence, what he's saying in 53, 1, when he says, uh, Lord, who has believed what they have heard from us? He's saying to Israel, saying, the message, the good news will be sent out and it will be preached for you to hear. So it's not a sending problem. It's not a preaching problem. It's not a hearing problem. But here's the thing is, will you believe it? The arm of the Lord, which is Jesus Christ, well, the arm, the right arm, <laughs> which is metaphorically, is Jesus Christ. That's the one who's going to be revealed and who will believe when that arm is revealed. Once the Messiah is revealed, will you believe it? That's what Isaiah is saying. And then he goes on to talk about this suffering servant who, who dies for the sins of the people. Will you believe it? And then he quotes Psalm 19.4. This is interesting. Where uh, King David says that nature, right, let's, let's look at the passage that he quotes. Their voice has gone out to all the earth and their words to the end of the world. What's interesting there is he's actually talking about nature there. Kind of like Paul talks about in Romans 1. He's talking about the heavens declare the, the handiwork of God. It declares his glory, right? And so in, uh, in the psalm, in Psalm 19, it's saying that nature preaches. Nature preaches of God. But Paul, he applies this to the prophets, to which came to Israel and preached, right? The good news that there was a Messiah coming, right? That there was an anointed one that was going to come, a king after David that was going to come and rescue the people. So he speaks of the, uh, the prophets. He speaks of Jesus himself. The very Messiah would come and preach the good news of the kingdom, that God is reigning through me and I'm here. And then God is going to send his apostles out and they read the book of Acts. They're preaching to the Jews. They start with the Jews, and then moves on to the Gentiles. And so they have been preached to. And so sometimes people hear, they just don't believe. And that was the issue with Israel. Not as a whole, again, there's a remnant. There were those who believed, but a lot of them did not believe. Why? It's a hard issue. It was a hard issue. Verse 19 but I asked, did Israel not understand, Paul says. Did Israel not understand? He says, first Moses says, I will make you jealous of those who are not a nation. With a foolish nation, I will make you angry. What does he mean there? Paul quotes this prophetic poem of Moses in Deuteronomy 32, where God is basically telling Israel, look, Israel, when you turn to other gods and you stubbornly rebel against me, when you do that, I'm going to make you jealous by favoring other, other nations. Even some of those nations like that you turn to the, their gods. I'm going to make you jealous by those very people. And Israel's like, whoa, 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 wait a second. Wait, what do you mean? This is the people in Paul's day. What do, you, what, what do you mean? They aren't your people. We're your people. They haven't served you. And God's like, well, neither of you. Neither have you. Here's the thing. Those other nations, they were always a part of my plan. The good news was always for all people. You were the funnel. You were the vessel that was to bring it to all of those people. And I brought the Messiah through you. I brought the good news through you. And then God uses Israel's, or Israel's jealousy to to bring them back when they're like, whoa, 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 hold up. Wait, you're, you're turning to them now, you know? And God's like, yeah, everybody who repents and who turns to me, I will save them. They're welcomed into my kingdom. And the hope is, Paul says the hope is, is they're like, I want some of that, you know? He says, then, then Isaiah is so bold as to say, 
I have been found by those who did not seek me. I have shown myself to those who did not ask for me. But of Israel, he says, all day long I have held out my hands to a disobedient and contrary people. Man, he, he, he loves stick, he's really sticking with Isaiah here in, in all of these, these quotes. That's the thing about the Old Testament. It all comes together, right? It all tells this story, man. And once you start like putting it together, like the New Testament, it's, it's, it's the Old Testament in light of Jesus. And that's what, he sh- that's what he's showing them. Paul quotes Isaiah 65, verses 1 and 2, where God, is ba- you know, God says, All day long I've held out my hands to a disobedient and contrary people. In other words, God's saying, I'm not going to sit around with stubbornness forever. I am a patient God. And the same is true today. God is patient, right? He doesn't will, wish that any would perish, but all would come to repentance. It was the same with Israel. But he says, I'm not going to sit around forever. That's what the prophet said. The prophet said, he's patient, right? He's got good news coming, but he's not going to sit around. He's not going to be patient forever. Turn to him, right? Repent and turn back to God. I'm not going to sit around with stubbornness forever just because you're the nation that I called through Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, right? Because it's not Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. It's not being a physical descendant of them that makes you right with God. It's Jesus, right? It's faith. That's what I want. The call is to trust and obey me through faith. That's what I'm looking for. That's the people that I want for myself, a people who trust me, right? And love me and, and seek me. That's what I'm looking for. And here's the thing. I'm opening the doors to others because I want them all. (laughs) Both Jews and Gentiles, right? We focus on Jews not believing, but it's only a remnant of Gentiles too. You know, it's not like everybody, all the Gentile world believed. Is God, what what is God saying? He's like, oh, I want want some of the Jews who will believe. I want some of America who will believe. I want some of Iraq who will believe. I want some of Zambia who will believe. Everybody, you all get the opportunity, and I want you in my kingdom. The invitation is open to the party. Come on in. Now, I'm going to take a remnant, all those who believe. These Old Testament quotes that Paul is quoting show why many Jews didn't believe. That's what he's trying to show them. It's there in the context. It's not just the scripture. Read the whole chapter and stuff. It's there in the context. They weren't just arbitrarily chosen not to believe. Rather, God had spread out his hands. This is what he says. I've spread out my hands all day to a rebellious people who walk in a way that is not good, following their own devices. That's why they didn't believe. Right there. It's right there. Isaiah 65, 2. I've spread out my hands all day to a rebellious people who walk in a way that is not good, following their own devices. It wasn't because God just randomly chose them not to believe. They were following their own devices. They were rebellious. Not all of them. So here's the thing. The Jews that did not believe in Jesus hadn't believed God beforehand. So they didn't come to Jesus when God revealed him. When God revealed his arm like in Isaiah 53, 1. When God revealed the Messiah, they didn't come because they weren't seeking the Father. They were seeking their own righteousness, right? They thought that they were just special because they were Abraham's children. And I, I, I think this is a big reason for John the Baptist's ministry of, 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 of baptism. It was to prepare the hearts and the minds of Jesus for his appearing. So he's, God isn't just like, hey, I'm just going to trick you, and I'm going to bring in this Messiah. No, I'm going to prepare you. I'm going to send... I'm gonna send um, uh, John the Baptist in the spirit of Elijah, and he's going to prepare the way for the Lord. You know, what does it mean to prepare the way? He's like, hey, repent. Change your hearts and your mind. You need to change your, your paradigm because God is about to send the Messiah, right? And you need to change your way of thinking. Come and, and receive this baptism of repentance, this baptism of John, right? And he was preparing their hearts so their hearts would be softened, right? And so they would be in the right place when the Messiah showed up on, on the scene and they would be ready to receive him. Isn't that a lesson for us? Like, even as believers, if you're not a believer, to prepare your heart for the Messiah, to turn to Jesus, to repent. But for us as believers, to prepare our hearts in humility and surrender in order for God to speak. That's why I say the Christian life is all about constant surrender. It's about us getting out of the way so that we can trust in God. Because when we're just living life our way, 
we're going to be stubborn to God. We're going to be stiff-necked. We're not going to listen. We're just going to go on default. We're going to go our own way. And so the Christian life is a life of getting out of the way, surrender and humility, and preparing our hearts so that God can speak and say, okay. And the Pharisees, Jesus, I've said this before, Jesus was trying to show them a different way. Not a different way. It wasn't, it wasn't a new script. It was the fulfillment of the old script, right? When he brings in the new. But they had this certain mindset of the way that things should be. And they were stubborn and they wouldn't listen because their hearts and minds weren't prepared to receive something new. That's why he said you need new wineskins if you're going to pour in wine. Because if you pour it into the old wineskins, it's just going to burst. You need to be made new, right? You got to have this new mindset. You need to return and be like children. Like, just think differently to open. Oh, you know, what do children do? They sit at your feet. Oh, God, daddy, mommy, tell, you know, tell me, teach me. I'm ready to learn. And that's the way us as Christians, that's the way we've got we've to approach the Christian life that way. We got to continue to do that, to become like children and say, God, speak. What are you saying? What are you saying? That was John the Baptist's ministry, was preparing them to receive because Israel, their hearts were hardened, right? And God loved them, and he's preparing them, right? And so there were those like, uh, was it Nathaniel who was under the tree? Jesus says, I saw you praying. Yeah, he's like, man, a true Israelite. What does he mean by that, true Israelite? Because I want people that seek me by faith. I want people to love me. Not to just be standing behind the law of Moses, I want people who love me in spirit and truth. That's my heart. I want a real people. I want a relationship. That's what I want. So we return to the question, if the gospel is so powerful, why don't some people turn to Jesus? And here, sometimes it's just ignorance because people need to go. And if people aren't going, then people aren't hearing, and the gospel needs to be preached, or the gospel is being preached wrongly. Here's the thing. If we will look under the surface sometimes, if we can look under the surface, right? Again, we see the outside. God sees the heart. If we were able to look under the surface, a lot of times there's more there. It's unbelief. And see, this message is, is, is convicting to me because many of you know I'm, I'm, I'm big, I'm really big on deciphering what I'm, what I'm responsible to and what I'm responsible for. Right? I've, I've learned a lot of things in life. I've learned this distinction between you're not responsible for everything, right? You're responsible for yourself. You're not responsible for for, for others. You're responsible to others, not for others. And so we're responsible to speak the truth. We're responsible to get the good news out. We are responsible for that. We are responsible to do it with love. We are not responsible for whether they receive it, whether they receive us. We are not responsible Preaching to Scott, this guy, I'm a people pleaser at heart. <laughs> I like people to like me, right? The Bible says we are not responsible for whether people receive the gospel, whether they receive us, right? So when you go and you, you, you scatter the seed of the gospel and you tell the good news, if people don't come, that's not your responsibility. You don't have to carry that weight on your shoulders. And we're not responsible for whether people receive Jesus. So the key point is this, and the whole message. Let's make sure that this world's lack of faith is not a sending problem, not a preaching problem, and not a hearing problem. Amen? Amen.